So now we move for the next uh, talk. Uh, uh, the next talk is not about uh, the agriculture robotic. It's more for uh, uh, underwater and marine robotics. And we have two speaker for the same talk. And uh, uh, the, uh, the first speaker is the uh, Lisa Struth. Uh, she is uh, the chief business development and the creative officer uh, at the, the Proteus uh, Ocean Group. And uh, the Professor Mark Peterson, uh, he is the professor of the marine and the environmental science uh, at the Northeastern University. So I welcome both. Thank uh, you. Sorry. Yeah, that's great to hear you. Yeah. Terrific. Terrific. Well, we're thrilled to be here. Good morning. Good afternoon, wherever you are. It's morning for us. Um, we are really excited to talk about uh, what we call... Uh, Lisa, I think you have some fans here. Uh... Yeah? Yeah. Mr. Suleiman is saying hi. Oh, hey. How are you? Nice to see you or hear you. Anyway. I'm going to start showing by showing you guys a video before we switch to our presentation, just to give you a, a quick uh, inspiration for what we're building. And let me share my screen. Let's see. Okay. Does that look good? Uh, I can't see it uh, on my end yet. It's just before it was Ria. It's still uh... maybe Lisa needs permission to share. Um... Well, it seems to be letting me share. Oh, okay. Let's try this. Do you see that? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. <laughs> Let me go back. Here we go. Try again. Before it was reality, the moon landing was just a dream. A wide-eyed idea that hardly anyone thought could come true. Three, two, one. Until it did. There was plenty of room for doubt along the way. Where we are strong and where we are not. But when a dream is audacious enough. We choose to go to the moon. Nothing can vanquish it. 50 years later, we're embarking on the next great mission, led by aquanaut Fabian Cousteau. A mission so daunting, it has forced many explorers to stand down. Inspired by their attempts, these brave men and women are picking up the torch. Meet the aquanauts who dream to live and work deep below the ocean's surface. This is our generation's moon living. This is Proteus, the world's most advanced underwater station to accelerate the most pressing oceanic research. Together, we'll venture deeper into the place where life began. And the place that has the potential to save life as we know it. Because the research and knowledge that we will uncover down here will forever change the way generations of humans live up here. Let's make history while saving the future. Let's make history with Proteus. That play okay on your end? I hope so. Okay, I am gonna switch to our PowerPoint now, so give me a second. Get a full screen. I have to share my screen first. Okay. 
How's that look? Is that good, Mark? So it's in presentation mode. Okay, let me, uh, how's that? Perfect. Okay. Great, all right. So you got a, a quick glimpse of a very early, kind of a bit of a fanciful design for Proteus, but the idea that we're working on building is the same. Um, as the video told you, this is led by Jacques Cousteau's first grandson, uh, Fabian, who's been scrutinizing since the age of four. And the idea for Proteus, the inspiration for it, came from a project called Mission 31, which Fabian led. This was um, a group of aquanauts living underwater for 31 days. Interestingly, one day longer than Fabian's um, No coincidence there. Uh, but he saw on this project that the four aquanauts that were working down there could spend about a thousand hours underwater in 31 days, which is the equivalent of about three years worth of research. Um, let's calculate. It generated 9,800 9, press articles, 34 billion unique impressions. Fabian really saw that this was a game changer, but that it could be bigger, more advanced, and, and better and offer more toys and bells and whistles to more industries. So the time is now, um, as our previous speaker was saying, you know, over 90% of the ocean is unknown. Um, the ocean absorbs 25% of our carbon dioxide emissions and 90% of the heat from those emissions. Um, we kind of need the ocean. And so now is a really important time to get this thing in the water and accelerate ocean research coupled with robotics, human robotic presence. So we call this an ocean technology accelerator for science and research, um, and also for global engagement um, as, as Mission 31 proved. This is a, a more accurate concept design for Proteus. As you can see, it's a fully modular design. We can have individual payloads there. Um, and it will be the world's largest, most technologically advanced. It is designed to be comfortable for very long-term stays of weeks or months, which has not been possible before. It's open to the public and private sector and will be inviting down technologists, scientists, um, art, astronauts, artists, filmmakers. Um, it's really open to whoever has a use for this. So again, this is the modular design at its full complement of payloads, as you can see. Um, on the top corner, you see a concept drawing of our private Aquanaut suite, which I will talk a little more about in a bit. And on the bottom, you can see that there's a full array of garages for robotic and submarines, coupled with uh, the placement of Proteus. So this is the full Proteus ecosystem. As you can see, we're bringing the human down and then we're um, connecting that human with every uh, robotic marine toy we can think of. Submarines, ROVs, AUVs, ASVs, um, the full gamut. So really the, the robotics is extending the reach of the humans and the humans are extending the efficiency of the robots by adding that element of human observation. So we, we really see this as a game changer for research and development. Um, it's it's uh, on mission 31, they did a few technological tests as well and found that it shaves months off the usual production and testing schedules um, when you can put people down there for such a long period of time to experiment observe and then react in real time um, without surfacing and going back to the lab in between. It's also a game changer for the planet. Um, we are looking at studies on carbon dioxide removal, climate refugia, super corals, acoustics role in healthy reefs, a whole vast array of ecological science projects um, in the planning stages for Proteus. So from a business point of view, we're leveraging three growing economies, uh, space and digital, I think we all get instinctively. The blue economy, everyone in this room probably gets. If um, my favorite stat is that if it were a nation, the ocean would be the seventh largest nation on the planet. And so in those three economies, we break our 
um, sectors down into these five buckets. And I don't, I, I want to let you hear from Mark, so I don't have time to go into all the different services and, and facilities we're offering on Proteus, but I want to give you a, a tease and a, a little highlight of um, the different things we'll be doing on board Proteus. And if you have more questions or want to know more, we'll share contact information at the end. So in space, Proteus offers the best space analog venue for training that will exist. Um, it's a real risk environment with real isolation, um, perfect for uh, simulating the extremes of a space mission. Um, it's really terrific for doing psychological testing and training, mission testing mission protocols, and uh, working on crew cohesion, um, testing equipment and robotics that will be used in space. Much, much cheaper to do all this in the ocean than to send it up into space and test it where reacting to a problem um, or getting a spare part could be quite difficult. Um, likewise, we will rely on a lot of life-sustaining technology, food, water, waste, oxygen, um, hygiene. These are all the same life-sustaining technologies that astronauts and space travel requires. And so this is a fantastic test bed for a lot of that technology to work and refine and experiment with different ways of doing that. Um, all kinds of other product testing as well, from robotics to um, data centers, um, hosted payloads of all kinds, again, private and public sector. And of course, we'll be gathering a lot of data that Mark will talk more about. Human health. Um, Really interesting uh, areas here too. We're um, talking to some folks about stem cell research, which is impacted by the added pressure in a, in a really interesting way. Uh, remote surgery, remote medicine, hyperbaric medicine, nutrition, all kinds of human health implications, psychological, the psychology of, of extreme environments and isolation, um, and also ecological health and resilience, which I mentioned earlier. We will have a private Aquanaut program. We'll be offering that beautiful suite you saw earlier to a very small number of private Aquanauts who will train and work with our scientific crews underwater. Um, and, and where we're building this has beautiful reefs, so this will be a real treat. We also uh, will be pursuing that global engagement with a vengeance. When it's appropriate, we intend to tell all the stories from the bottom of the ocean to students and global audiences in every media from live streaming to filmed entertainment. So we, we feel that the way putting humans in space captured public imagination around the space program, Proteus, we believe, has that capacity for the ocean. And we're really excited to tell those stories. And uh, we're working right now on the first of a handful um, aiming for a connected network of data centers monitoring the ocean with both human and robotics 24-7. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mark to um, talk through some more of what we'll be doing there. Thanks, Lisa. If we could go to the next slide. I'm Mark Patterson. Uh, I direct the Field Robotics Laboratory at Northeastern, and I'm a science advisor to the Proteus Ocean Group. And as I think I told Eric, uh, living underwater, which I've done for 90 days during my career over 10 different missions, is the most uh, exciting thing I've ever done as a scientist engineer. And I can't wait for Proteus uh, to be a, a, a working system. Uh, we've picked Curacao off the coast of Venezuela. It's part of the Netherlands Antilles as our first site. And part of that reason is that it provides some unique research opportunities. For one, the reef is still relatively healthy, it's still accreting, that is growing. And secondly, the topography, as you can see in the uh, upper slide, we, we did some mapping, plunges very quickly into deep water. And this allows us access to a deeper part of the reef that's very hard to obtain via scuba diving. So going deeper uh, allows us, yes, we can go to the next one. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about the sensor network we have planned and then the connection with robotics. Uh, but we all know the problem is that the ocean changes faster than we 
have the ability to observe. Uh, if we look at that uh, graph of a sine wave there, um, if we could go back one slide, the, the dots are where we actually collected data, but nature was doing the fast up and down. And so a lot of the stories we tell ourselves in marine science are limited by the speed at either space or time that we can actually gather the data. So the answer to that is, next slide please, is the sensor network we have planned, uh, as well as um, the robots that will work with the aquanauts as part of the human presence. So we will be wiring up the coral reef uh, in Curacao around the station for light and sound. We're gonna have water quality sensors, acoustic sensors, many kinds of imagers. This network will probably not be cabled for the most part. We're going to leverage um, about 22 different patents from Northeastern University in mesh network technology. So we'll have acoustic and optical modems uh, connecting all these sensors. These data will come back to the Aquanauts uh, in the station and an AI will be running that will be watching this fire hose of data and letting the scientists engineers know when interesting things are happening so that they can catch these high frequency events and avoid this aliasing problem that's plagued marine science for so long. Next slide, please. So I don't need to tell this group that one of the advantages of robotics is that they don't get tired. Uh, they can work 24 seven. They're really just limited by their batteries. Uh, these are some of the robots that have come out of Northeastern University from my laboratory, ranging from small to big. Um, the behaviors that you can implement are um, the sky's the limit in terms of, of what these uh, robots can do. They can also work deeper on the reef than the aquanauts maybe could safely venture. So we can get down into that mesophotic zone we do have plans for humans uh, to go into the mesopodic, but that will be a secondary uh, development of Proteus. Um, so the robots are gonna do some heavy lifting at depth. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we anticipate that uh, Proteus will be, as Lisa showed in the previous uh, slide, uh, a place of refuge for the robots. They'll come back to recharge their batteries. We'll have a garage there. Uh, they'll dump their data at high speed using optical modems. Some of these will be tethered ROV style robots. Others will be free swimmers like the one shown here. Uh, we're going to have to worry because of the long missions we anticipate of uh, many weeks to months about this problem that plagues sensors that are put in the ocean called biofouling, where organisms actually grow on surfaces and maybe uh, impede the flow of data or the operation. But we believe that's a soluble problem, and we've been working with partners in the shipping industry to try some new tech to, pr to prevent this from being a, a, a showstopper. Next slide, please. So a lot of the folks in this audience are interested in human-machine interface and the human factors component, and this is a really ripe area that we'd like to partner with those of you at this conference. Uh, so I'd love to talk more about this. Uh, we anticipate that the robots will be uh, working with robot, uh, excuse me, the aquanauts will be working with robot companions. They will, they will in essence be co-workers in little teams. And we hope that the use of the robots is gonna increase the safety of the human beings. There are some open questions that we don't know yet is what, what's the way to increase efficiency of data acquisition when you've got humans working with robots? What's the optimal concept of operations? Um, what if some uh, humans don't have a robot uh, for a day or a week? Uh, do they develop jealousy for their coworkers that are living with them because uh, they don't have a, a robot companion to help them? Um, on the citizen science side, uh, I did an experiment 10 years ago shown in the lower right there with kids who are only 12 years old in the US. It was an enrichment program and, and we discovered that 12 year olds can actually learn to effectively program a quarter million dollar free swimming vehicle and troubleshoot it and take ownership of the data that it's gathering. So because we will have a high-speed internet connection to the uh, habitat, this is a marvelous opportunity to educate the public about the value of automation and robotics uh, as we move into further into the 21st century. Next slide, please. 
we got to get the HMI right. Uh, and this is going to, again, take partnerships with folks like you. Uh, we imagine that when the aquanauts are outside, they're going to need haptics to have situational awareness. We don't want collisions between the humans and the robots. Uh, the aquanauts would like to know where the robots are as well as their, as their human partners out there. We've already implemented ways to uh, allow the robots to approach, and then you can use a touch key system to select pre-selected canned missions for the robot to execute. But a lot of this uh, new approach is to leverage AI saying, hey, there's something interesting going on uh, at 50 meters deep today involving the plankton. Let's redirect and see what's going on. And the modality that divers already use is they use hand gestures shown in panel C. Uh, so we are training our robots to be able to recognize three-dimensional hand gestures to modify the mission that they're about to execute. So our goal is shown in the upper right there, that we, we see that uh, the sum is greater than the, than the parts, that we can have curious aquanauts working with robots together. Next slide, please, Lisa. Oh. One thing that's a tremendous opportunity, and we hope that you can partner with us on this, is smartphones can now go diving. This is actual product that we're looking at here, not vaporware. This is a huge opportunity given the uh, processing power on modern smartphones for edge computing. So augmented reality will be uh, totally deployed at as many levels as we can with the humans in the loop. This is a notional concept showing the, the aquanauts out there with their smartphone and a, a sea turtle went by and um, the camera was pointed at the object and the scene was interpreted uh, probably using a transformer algorithm and some metadata immediately came up saying, hey, you saw this, you saw this uh, turtle uh, a few days ago at this time and that uh, can be overlaid with uh, physical parameters on the reef itself. So this gives the scientists and the engineers, if they're testing um, robotic systems, uh, a brand new way of getting their work done. Because remember, when the aquanauts are working from the habitat, they're actually not inside most of the day. They're outside doing work on this marvelous coral reef. Uh, next slide, please. So. Uh, that's the end of uh, my little bit here, and uh, I can. Um, uh, speak to some of the science and tech and some of the machine learning approaches uh, during the Q&A, and then Lisa can tell you more if you're interested about our business model. But we really do believe this is going to transform humanity's view of the ocean by putting humans on the seafloor, and the secret sauce is going to be they're going to have robots and sensors helping them with AI steering the whole ship. Thanks, uh, Lisa and Mark, for the wonderful. Uh presentation.